Hello, welcome to this episode of The Living Process. My name is Greg Madison. And this time, my guest is Joao de Fonseca. Uh, Joao's from Lisbon. And uh, I had the pleasure of first meeting him when he was in his uh, the last stages of his training as an existential psychotherapist. And I went to offer his class uh, some introduction into focusing and uh, experiential psychotherapy. And he, along with some of his classmates, became so interested in focusing that I ended up going back uh, along with a couple of other colleagues to offer a two-year certification training. And Joao was one of the few people that um, really followed through on focusing and became very uh, engaged in the international community and made a lot of connections with other teachers and coordinators and himself has become a coordinator for uh, the International Focusing Institute. In this episode, uh, we talk a little bit about Joao's uh, sort of general context, but mostly we talk about his uh, most recent passion, which is psychedelic assisted therapy and how that has influenced his view of uh, therapy and of focusing. And he also gives us a really nice sort of uh, outline of the different substances that are used in those forms of therapy and how they have different kinds of impacts. My impression at the end of the conversation was that we, we opened up a lot of different areas all of which really deserve more time. Uh, so we may need to have a follow-up, but I'd be interested in any comments you have if there's particular aspects of psychedelic assisted therapy and focusing that you would uh, like us to explore further. So here's our conversation, uh, The Living Process and Joao de Fonseca. So I want to welcome you, Joao, to The Living Process. Um, looking forward to talking to you about... But first of all, like with everybody, I'm curious if you want to tell your story of how you got into focusing or into Jendlin's work, sort of how you came upon it. That's pretty easy because the main cause is right in front of me. It's materialized, so there's not too much abstractions or narratives. So I have to thank you, of course, Greg. And uh, I, I didn't, you know, I, I, I was doing a training in, in existential psychotherapy. Um, I, I, I went there after uh, my phase on transpersonal training also, which was beautiful and still present in my life right now. Um, but in terms of people being more into connection to the transpersonal or modified states of consciousness, it was it was it was hard to find them. So it's kind of hard to um, uh, um, have have the job in the in the in the clinical practice in a way. So I, I said, well, we better find out something that more uh, concrete, more into our uh, existential realm. So I went I went to the, that training and and, and um, I think it was in the probably the third year of our training where we met you and and you you came out with the the work of of uh, uh, Jenglin and and um, the experiential process and um, you know theoretically it was amazing to be open to that but then the, the major um, and the nuclear uh, um, wave that opened up everything was was how 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 you presented ourselves how you presented yourself and how focusing was in our in our body everything that we do and um i i i, I was almost like uh thinking oh well, well, how could i not heard about this before <clears throat> mm -hmm. why, why was this hidden in a way yeah and from there everything started you know this deeply connection to yourself uh, to what you're really feeling outside of uh, uh 
all these narratives and um, all this hypervigilance and even the effect of being a psychologist and a psychotherapist at the same time, so locked in that conceptual world in a way, <clears throat> and the body is not there. So you just this was a rebirth <laughs> in mm. a way of, of presence, of, of finding my own inner GPS. And then we were all moved, of course, and the partnerships and came out. And, and then after that, we, we, we asked you, begged you to, to have a, a course for a group here with, with us. Um, and, and there it started everything. Then I started my connection with the, uh, the TV, um, mm. and tried to make some translations also and going more deeply into, um, Jensen's work. And, and, and then I even had this, uh, invitation with, with a little scholarship to go to, to Switzerland to the, to the Congress. And, and there was also a pivotal moment because I could live for one week with focusing world people, mm -hmm. uh, and relations and interactions. And that was like, uh, an utopia uh, in a way. Uh, I had to come back to the world, and afterwards it was hard. Yeah, those conferences are really a, a special atmosphere. And the the training, I just want to mention, it was also with uh, Nicoletta and Astrid. Um, so it was the three of us kind of worked together with you. I remember those days. Very enjoyable. I just want to... Absolutely, Greg. And I'm just like, of course, Nicoletta and Astrid and their, their other reels and doors that they gave to us yeah so, yeah so yes i um i know about how you came into focusing so it's kind of a a slightly trick question in this case <laughs> <laughs> but it was, um, it was needed yeah but it's interesting to me because a lot of people that learn focusing uh, kind of learn it and then disappear. They go back into whatever world they were in, maybe continue to practice it or integrate it into their work or their lives, but they don't make the connection to the international focusing community. But you did do that. And I'm, I'm curious if you have any insight into what makes the difference, what made you actually kind of embrace the world of focusing as much as you have, like you've, you've, you know, become uh, better known internationally. And I've seen that you've been, you know, working with other teachers and stuff. So somehow you've really gotten into it. I'm curious why you and not some of your colleagues that took the same training. Yeah, you know, um, the, the, what I have heard from, from them in a way it's just precisely what you described there's uh, they picked up something really valuable and they they love focusing it's incredibly meaningful for them the way they're uh listening to people not only in the work but outside it just you know it was was uh, um it's it, it stood with them um but they got back to their <clears throat> own, own lives and um uh, i guess the the the, the meetings with all of us together didn't came through. It just lasted for maybe five years after we were all trained. Okay. Um, and something got a little bit dispersed on, on that. Um, then it opened up. I remember some other people opening up to things like somatic experiencing, uh, internal family systems, almost like following the same river. But it kind of sounded like it was a, a door that a main door that opened to. Um, other um, branches of experiential work. In my, in my case, I mean, that hit me so hard at my core. It was everything because I I took on a path where it was uh, first on transpersonal psychology, then existential therapy, uh, and and then focusing kind of a, and, and between that, I was searching for. Uh, uh, um, other ways of being with, with people and exploring our our, our own healing, um, but we got to a point where was too many files opened and 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 focusing brought this this body 
and and that never left. So um, it, it was an inside movement. I, I, I uh, the more I, I got into connection with people and with TFI and all the different um, varieties where this can be applied, the more I got in, in contact with me. And through all these years, I never. I maybe missed like one or two weeks without doing a focusing partnership, for example, um, different ones. So uh, I've been talking to the experiential gym and I, I, I cannot be uh, um, too much time apart from it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess here we didn't agglomerate it as, as a group somehow. I don't really know. Um, what 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 kind of happened but i i i <clears throat> i then became a coordinator it has been a little bit difficult to to find my uh, trainings but been working more in uh um other other areas as much as i can help with, with yeah. translations and uh being part of focusing highlights or, or yeah home groups that's where where it's been happening in a way so, so yeah. I know that you, um, you have your own clinical practice and that you do offer trainings. Um, but it's interesting to me that it's like, as the, the time after the training, eventually the group you trained with kind of dispersed a little bit and didn't stay together as a focusing training group or whatever. Um, that somehow that's the thing that sort of people get a little bit potentially isolated in their focusing or something, or maybe they continue a partnership, but the rest of us in the focusing community never hear about them again. So mm -hmm. the world could be littered with all of these focusing people that we know nothing about. Uh, yeah. Lost contact with. But anyway, uh, the thing I really want to ask you about is I know that the other part of your work at the moment is in and i don't know how you would say it psychedelics yeah psychedelic assisted therapy okay so i'm very curious about that and about how you if you do integrate focusing into that and i'm also curious about um the different kinds of psychedelics that are being used like the ones that i'm familiar with psilocybin lsd yeah. mdma ketamine so i'm just curious if you could tell us a little bit about that world because some people i, I imagine are very interested in it but may not know that much about it yeah sure we're just like living this um what we call the psychedelic renaissance in a way exactly and also, just like getting back to the later question, I, this which connects also with with, with what's happening with with the uh, psychedelic field, but this sense of uh, <clears throat> community or the integration part, which is after you have an experience or a learning or you learn focusing or you have a psychedelic experience in a therapy assisted, um, the most important part of all of that, of course, the experience is important. But it's uh, the integration, how you bring that back to your life. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's not, it's really hard if you do it by your own. So if you have, there's even like t shirts, models saying the best thing about psychedelics is not psychedelics, it's the community. Mm -hmm. So how you create a critical mass afterwards with people that know the same language and then you get together there, it just, it's what, kind of holds everything and and the integration would be like the net and, and the changes that you can do in your life of course by yourself but then the support is, is fundamental so that's interesting because um what you've just said there makes me wonder if one of the differences between people that kind of link more to the community as you're saying and people that kind of disappear from from view maybe part of the difference is that the people that do take focusing as something for their lives not just as a clinical 
sort of method or something to integrate into their work, but people that seriously integrate it into their lives, maybe they're more likely to seek the community. Yeah, absolutely. It opens it opens more. Um, yeah. And and also you receive more also because exactly. the other will come with you and will, will intervene and link. Yeah. Yeah, you're not lonely on that path in a way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this was all very recent. I, I think focusing in psychedelic assisted therapy, Greg, are just made for each other. <laughs> All this can sound. Um, <clears throat> and also is not very well known in, in the psychedelic community yet, but I, I, I honestly believe it can have a, a purpose. Also scared because Sometimes there are things that are good that they keep a little bit hidden because the world can really colonize things and uh, totally transform them, uh, make it into a capitalist view. So there's also that danger. The, the same happens with, with us as persons and as being in the world. We might lose track with what is uh, essential. Um, but all, all, all the work of... of, of, of uh, Gendling and all the trainings I kind of had as I'm working in this area, I was just, you know, with other names, I was just seeing everything um, uh, and, and, and uh, common, in common with, with, mm. with, with Jane's work. Um, I, um, I, I was always personally really afraid of this. Uh, substances, we would call it drugs. That's also a conceptual way. And now we kind of should not talk about drugs. They're substances in a way because the science has shown like they don't have, if used responsibly uh, and in the right context with the right preparation, they don't uh, create a toxicity in, in your body, uh, neither uh, dependence. Uh, mm -hmm generally speaking. So this makes them have, you know, a different name than what we associate with, with, with drugs in a way. But for me growing up, that was uh, all, all the same, of course. Um, um, and and um, my, my mother was a doctor and the conversations about uh, the problems and Portugal had a really big crisis also with, with heroin. Um, which then changed into a uh, um, progressive policy uh, regarding drugs and helped a lot to take off a lot of criminalization and health issues. Um, but I, I had my own stories. I remember a person that was uh, in my, I was barely a teenager, my friends, and I, I remember there was a person around the garden where we'd stay and he would come very slowly and rubbing his hands and asking for a cigarette. And, and the story about that person was like, oh, he, he, uh, before he graduated, he went to this party and he took some MDMA and he fried his brain. So mm -hmm. we don't know if these things are true or not, but you know the way some stories stayed in all of us, uh, you know, sometimes uh, are, are there in the paths that we take. And only in 2014, um, I was in my training, um, I, was, I was practicing first personal psychology and existential psychotherapy. I had an old friend from um, uh, uh, the, my transpersonal times, which was the first ones. Um, and he, he was the most uh, you know, ethical, sensible, uh, care person about uh, our emotional safety, uh, the way we do therapy. Um, is even even uh, coordinating trainings in this area, and and um, we were very familiar with modified states of consciousness. It's part of our own training and personal processes too. Um, and and he invited me to 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 go to this um, private ceremony in a, his his house. He was not going to be there, but his wife was going to participate. He was going to come a, a Argentinian shaman. And there was very tailored and selected people that were going to be there, nine or ten people. And he was uh, offering the, the beverage ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. And 
if it was not this friend, Greg, I think I would probably not be here talking about this because it had to be him to take all the, the fears I had uh, about it. Um, I would go on modified system of consciousness kind of works and processes and, and therapies, but not with not with substances, not with drugs. Mm -hmm. But since it was him, this gave me the trust to go. And that was my first encounter with the psychedelic uh, state. Uh, I, 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 I remember it was like spending the whole ceremony. My, my hand was um, like drumming in my heart all the time without stopping. And I, I knew that I didn't know what I was doing. That was the feeling. And mm -hmm. I just let my whole body just process the experience as it could. I was having also a lot of visuals about, um, you know, little atoms that create structures and with the sound and the drumming, they would disperse and open up and reshape and reform. So something was, I was learning something. But this state has a, a way to focus my attention, to bring it to the heart as a as another center of perception as an inner center of perception per perception and knowledge and wisdom and that goes beyond culture that goes beyond your watchtower that goes beyond your mental and cognitive conceptual rules whatever all of that you know, that is that was the biggest lesson for me and from then on i i i, I changed a lot of ways in in, in my way of being and got back to nature and to hiking and going in contact and my old cells kind of opened up again. Um, yeah, I knew focusing already there. Yeah. Um, so they just, it was, uh, I would say like, almost like, like focusing on steroids, <laughs> if you mm -hmm. want. Uh, it's, 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 it's different. You'd, it's not so gentle as, as focusing in a way because you just dive into this, um, uh, experiential real um and you cannot really stop it uh, when 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 the substance comes inside i mean there are ways to stop it when the substance comes inside is like an airplane you know you gotta lift if you don't like you have to hold on to it what it or if you're not prepared but the airplane is only gonna <laughs> land when it's gonna land and with focusing on other experiential processes that are natural you can you can stop uh, the process right there um, but this was um, overwhelming, surprising, and uh, I, I started then to 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 uh, know more there. And can um, I just say that 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 I mean I I'm really appreciating hearing your experiences and how you kind of initially got into this, but um, I'm also curious if you've just said something that um, might be quite uh kind of fundamental is that when you take at least most of these substances in my experience at least when you take them there is a kind of handing over or giving in it's like it's kind of like okay whatever happens i'm on board because i can't just jump i'll have to wait for this to land and until then i'm in your hands so to speak and if there's something about that that is, as you were saying, kind of almost heart opening or something that it does require, at least if you have a good experience, maybe if you have a bad experience, it's because you resist this, but it requires kind of that uh, kind of emotional trust. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and this is one thing um which sometimes can be a little bit unethical in terms of some studies that happened um, with, with psychedelics, which is people never had an experience of a, a modified state of consciousness or to connect to their felt sense, for example, or some of them never done therapy uh, or some have done therapy, but only on a talk therapy in a way. So if this was an ideal world, it would really, really be important for the person to open up those emotional uh, processes, connect to felt sense, to the implicit wisdom of the body, um, different layers of your 
of your awareness and consciousness and build up a trust first before yeah. going into something like this. It can be, um, for some people, it can be even be re-traumatizing uh, if, if the preparation is not done um, and if the follow-up also is not done. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was talking about my experience sleep. Luckily, it was, it has always been um, meaningful. Uh, it's like focusing for me, doing, I, I had the opportunity in my training also um, because I made part of a team where we did uh, research on, on, on psilocybin. <clears throat> and we were going to do also research on MDMA with PTSD. But that study uh, didn't, the last part didn't happen. But I, I, I got the privilege of having both experiences. They, they invited the, the investigators and the, the mm -hmm. therapists, like when you're doing any kind of training in therapy. So it's, it's important to do your own personal process. So they, they in, invited me to have uh, experience with psilocybin in a clinical context. And then one year afterwards, I had the experience with MDMA. So I had all this training, uh, not only in transpersonal psychology, but also with focusing, and and it kind of say brings you more proficiency in how to navigate this. Imagining myself without any training, and and just going straight through something this uh, could be very scary. So it's really important that, that people are really uh, prepared. They know uh, what they're gonna go through, um, full emotional trust and full, full in a way, it, trust also in the person that's there with you, that's gonna uh, uh, be with you, traveling so, through those experiences. Yeah. Um, what we call the setting in a way. Um, yeah. Well, the first person that got you into this was somebody that you've described as really, you really trusted that person, and that's why you were there and mm -hmm. trying the ayahuasca i'm curious about um for you what would you say are is the difference between the psilocybin and the mdma did they have quite a different impact for you or i am remembering your first questions but we're going down the circle of waste it's also my yeah. <laughs> or spiral this is kind of weird yeah. um yeah you know generally we, we we have like this what we call the classic psychedelics or typicals or major psychedelics, um, which are psilocybin, which is the, the active substance of magic mushrooms, so it kind of it's more more known. Uh, LSD, which comes from a sort of a fungus of of uh, uh, um, oh I forgot it in in English, but the something like the the bread with, um, and and uh, you have mescaline that comes from a cactus. And you have DNT, which you can find in the ayahuasca beverage, but also in the toad. Mm -hmm. And you also have ibogaine. No, we not mentioned, but ibogaine is like this African plant root uh, that's also been used. So we, we will call this, also you can even call them entheogens, which, which it's like uh, entheogens means like a, manifesting the divine within. <clears throat> and these are things that you can find in nature. That are prepared you know, long ago. You can have uh, anthropological uh, records of mushrooms and mushroom head statues that date like five thousand years ago uh, in Guatemala, and they, they kind of spread all over. Mainly mushrooms because they are more, more, much more adaptable to the environment than than other things. Um, and and these were the ones that were used uh, for research, masculine and LSD, and then psilocybin, most of it. And then we have what we call the atypical um, psychedelics. Um, all of them, in a way, I would say they have a different signature, different experiential signature. And with this, you will join the variability of each person and, and, and uh, its own uh, awareness and, and embodiment of existential issues altogether so it's a complicated equation of how much things are, are there but they, they do have different uh, uh, signatures and with the uh, typical ones we, we have MDMA or MDA2 
um, we call these uh, um, empathogens and intactogens. Intacto is like inner tactus, is inner ta touch. Mm -hmm. uh, and empathogens is like the MDMA has this ability to create self-compassion, uh, compassion for others. It's also named as a medicine of the heart. Um, it, it, um, it kind of takes your your amygdala, which is a part of the brain that's hypervigilant, protecting you. Like maybe maybe where the inner critic might live in a way. It's just what I'm thinking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's always worried about the external things, what's dangerous for you. You know how to behave and position the right way. Da, 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 da. Um, it, it turns that off. And it allows that your emotional, emotional and embodied world and, and, and your biographical world or cognitive world to they kind of flow in a very intuitive embodied thing. It's um so it's it's, it's very particular for me to work with, with MDMA. Mm -hmm. Um it's existentially and in terms of psychotherapy, it's incredible because while the other ones the the major ones can like on the flower of your consciousness or bring you into mystical experiences or uh, deeply into also bad trips and deeply into uh, uh, issues of your life, but they might like uh, create this sort of mystical experiences somehow. Um, MDMA can also bring that, but it kind of just dives you deeply into yourself. Okay. Into the existential and your biographical, the things you have been carrying, uh, specific things you live in your life, it just dives you deeper into this uh, intuitive, embodied knowledge. It's almost like a therapist comes inside and just starts to uh, probing and taking you to the places that are needed to be acknowledged um, and lived. Also, ketamine fits here in the uh, typical. Uh, um, psychedelics um, and it's um, an anesthetic yeah anesthetic uh, anesthetic yeah <clears throat> and ketamine politically and socially and in terms of uh, uh, primary health systems has a great advantage towards the other ones because it has been approved has a, a, a anesthetic mm -hmm. you know it's one of the hundreds more more safe uh, medications that we have. It's used in children. It's used in animals. It's used for surgeries and the ambulances. Um, so he has all the science done behind it, and it's legal. So now ketamine is being used in what is called off label. Yeah. So that was not its main purpose. Uh, that the whole system uh, allowed it, it to have a voice in the place. Uh, it's been using uh, off-label, you know, things in the war of Korea, they find out that people that were, the, the soldiers that were treated with ketamine, uh, compared to the soldiers that were treated with opioids, the ketamine ones had less symptoms of PTSD uh, and anxiety and depression compared. So they went and followed this thread and then understood that they have also antidepressant and ansiogenic uh, Interesting effects yeah. um, so now it's available to be used and there are a lot of ketamine clinics like spreading in, in the world in a way to provide this for people mostly uh, with treatment resistant depression um, all of the other substances are still illegal they cannot be used only in studies uh, except now um, MDMA is being used in, in Australia um, it can be prescribed now in Australia as a, a compassionate use. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a legal possibility where if you have a substance or a drug or medication that's being studied and already thoroughly studied, um, but it's still not approved, then you can ask your doctor to uh, use it compassionately or expanded access, you know. So yes, they do they do have different ways like and MDMA could be much more this uh, losing your fear of relating with others, uh, accessing 
um, schemes and issues of, of, of trauma, um, understanding it from a different state of presence where you're not activated by your nervous system, um, receiving support and help from therapists if that is, is needed. Um, and um, ketamine could be something like a sort of meditative substance because it kind of uh, brings you to an experience of like you were being in another body. It's a space medicine, if you would call, like you kind of lose your form and you kind of awareness of that sense of William James about or awareness being like a water that kind of adapts to the form and the vehicle, the context where it is. Um, ketamine kind of does this. It, it takes you off this rumination thinking or the holes of depression where you are. And it's like, almost like you'd be floating. You know, your mind is in a different place and, and, and uh, your body seems to be in a different pay, place too. And that opens different windows. So this would be like, a different signature from one and from the other in the main and Kent. I was um, involved in some uh, ketamine therapy in the early 90s in Ireland. And so I resonate with some of what you're saying about ketamine. Um, for me, it depended an awful lot because, like you were saying, in order to be therapists in the project, we had to try it ourselves. So we had yeah. to see what the clients would be going through. Um, and for me, my experience depended an awful lot on the dose. <laughs> oh, yes. Because <laughs> we started on our, in our project, which was in a psychiatric hospital, we started giving very big doses at first. And uh, then we started to find that the smaller doses seemed more therapeutic in, in our project. So I'm curious if you found the same thing, that the dose has an impact on your experience or if you found that different doses are more useful or? Yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely, not only my personal experience, but also uh, uh, the protocols that now are available for people um, either in studies or either in the off-label use. Mm -hmm. um, there's also this this um concept of uh the importance of substance set and setting in yes. psychedelic therapy so in substance you would include what is the specific medicine that you're using can you use the word medicine mdma is going to try to be approved as a medicine and it's it's quite uh, close now it's really close um but you have all these different layers maybe in a ideal future you can tailor which could be the one for the person specific situation how can you use it or or then swap it to another one when it gets to certain yeah. objectives of therapy too um you know it's, it's interesting to, to to think about the possibilities that the future will will bring um uh, the off-label use of ketamine can allow you to tailor a little bit how many dosing you do but when you're doing research and then the clinical research, you only have specific amounts of dosage, maybe sometimes only one. Uh, and sometimes you might be in a study where it's random and you might have a sort of placebo and another one that's active. Um, in MDMA, you may have two, sometimes three dosing sessions, but no more um, okay. because that is the structure of the study is, is, is done in, in a way. So substance, it's there, and the dose. So all the protocols are very specific about it. There's a specific dosing for MDMA, and then you can use a, um, 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 a booster afterwards. That will not uh, intensify, but will just prolong more the, the effect in a way. Um, the studies with psilocybin, they've been doing like with 0 0.1 milligram, which is like basically a placebo then 10 milligrams, which is a, a mild one, and then 25 milligrams, which is considered the, the, the one that uh, can create um, mystical experiences or much more meaningful 
yeah. uh, and openness <clears throat> uh, on the effect of this on your awareness. Um, uh, ketamine also starts, there's a specific uh, small dose, which is enough to have effects. Sometimes some people don't respond to it. Uh, but then you have, you can augment that to a certain point, but no more or else either in ketamine has in any other dose, or even if you're not speaking about substances, even when you're doing focusing, if you spend one hour doing focusing and the, the, your partnership is listening to you, it might be too much information for you uh, to, to process. And, and getting back to the substance, if doses would be too high, then it's almost like there's no one there to process. Yeah, so exactly. you're the, I, I know this creates some um, dissolution of ego, for example, uh, transference of time and space, <clears throat> but this, there has to be a slight mm -hmm. thread towards something that's deserving. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm thinking as I'm listening to you, that it's it's a little bit like being able to kind of be in presence to parts of you. You have, in some way, you have to be there. There has to be some kind of consciousness or awareness of your experience. If the awareness itself has been blasted away by the dosage, then I guess it's a question of how much can be integrated afterwards. Exactly. So uh, the, just enough, you know, if, if, if you're not out there to process, my, people might say, okay, maybe in a subconscious level that's being processed, but it, you just, it's just too much. So, yeah. so. Um, but the, the too much, for example, in psilocybin or with LSD, uh, it's always at a certain point, if you do put a more dosage, then you start to go into this more, uh, even more dis dispersed and not having something to uh, process or, or to bring somehow. Can I just ask, um, are you offering kind of focusing oriented integration sessions for people afterwards? Yes, but unofficially, I would say. Yeah. Like, you're, you're sneaking yeah. in the focusing. Exactly. Just it's, it's there and how I listen to the person and how exactly. I, what she says about what she's feeling or what she says about what she lived in the ketamine experience, for example. Mm -hmm. So all of focusing is there without people knowing. Um, um, that has been the way I've, I've, I've been working uh, until now. And I, I hope. We'll see if something can be offered um, a part yeah. of training, not only for therapists, but also for people and mostly in their preparation. Yeah. Uh, we, can we I act. just go, go, go right. ahead. I was just going to ask the people that you do uh, meet with for like integration sessions after they've had an experience. Um, do you notice in terms of focusing, do you notice anything particular about them? Like, are they more able to get in touch with their body or more able to stay with experience? Or is there anything general like that, that you're starting to realize? Absolutely, Greg. Not only by my personal experience, but even in, uh, uh, I'm always talking about research and I was, it was hard for me to go to the empirical research, but some of the things are, are important, very important and the create um, democracy in how we use it and, and uh, a ground too. And um, there's this thing called like the critical period or critical moment. Uh, maybe in a general time we might call it the afterglow, for example, of uh, a psychedelic experience, either in, in, in therapy and a clinical context or recreationally um, but something stays in you there's this level of plasticity that you have that has been identified in in, in the brain so uh, neurogenesis and you're in very plastic and in a great moment to create new attitudes and behaviors um, and uh, the experience itself not only opens people to 
their interiority in the way some of them never experience. Mm -hmm. And that is very helpful. It's, in our clinic, we, we really ask for people to continue or start a process of therapy after this, because it just opens a door. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you need to take care of that 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 door. Um, the 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 main sessions we have like are preparation sessions, um, dosing session, and then one or two days, or maybe the next week, not more than that. You have the integration session. Yeah. So there's this period where you really notice. People are still connected to the experience, to the emotions that came, to the wonder, to the struggle, to uh, all the contexts that appear. And there, you see a different way in their reasoning about things, their narratives about things compared to the preparation session when they arrive and when you meet them. Like there's this sort of a little pause and then suddenly, uh, your, your your brain, your worldview just got a little bit or cracked or opened and and you're trying to make a new sense of that. That's where you kind of help to bring this new possibility and sometimes a new hope, uh, a new perspective of looking at things, a new ability that you might have inside that you never knew. Um, and, and they are very plastic in, in that sense is that can i just ask is that um if you were to say it very simply is that kind of the most common impact that you find is that after these psychedelic sessions or whatever sessions that the impact for you know maybe a week or two after at least is that there's this period of time where there's more space the person is more able to be with aspects of their process rather than be so close to it that they can't really process it uh okay. like um so close like when they're in the dosing and well i'm thinking i guess it's a question of um how you're because i imagine you've witnessed enough people go through these processes that you're starting to come up with ideas of kind of how is this helpful or what's really going on and well, i guess one of the things i'm wondering in focusing terms is if you're finding that the psychedelic experience helps a person have more space so that they can be with their struggles rather than be overcome by them, let's say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, 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 like I would say, like not only you have your experience doing the dosing session, which by itself, it's yeah. uh, a thing by itself, uh, new contact, new ex visions of you, ways of thinking, um, emotions, um, but then um, that moment where you're still not totally composed, um, it's it's an incredible uh, um, window that's opened. That is that is in fact pivotal. Um, what are you gonna do with that in terms of sustainability and consistency? How are you gonna bring that back to your life? Are you gonna return to the market and buy your vegetables and stuff and go into the world is also a major thing. And I would say, because this is uh, an experience, okay, it's created by a substance, um, but, you know, the, the substance is like, they are just like instruments. Um, Alan Watts said something like, if you got the message, hang up the phone. Because, you know, uh, these are just instruments like telescope, microscope, you know. And the biologist doesn't spend his whole life looking into the microscope. He just goes out into the world and, and works on what he has seen. 
but the fact that we have an experience, it's a subjective experience, um, it creates memory too. It's lived. So that is the memory of that <clears throat> can be uh, the medication, can be the, the antidepressant that you take. You remember uh, the new meanings that came, for example. Or you remember that you can answer something in a different way. So you live that uh, in the dosing session, for example. Um, and you kind of pick those things up in the critical moment, in the integration. Mm -hmm. And every time you have um, a struggling or challenging situation in your life, the memory, the the fact that you had a subjective experience of it, it's there to be invocated. It's there to alter mm -hmm. your chemistry. It's alter to alter your way of thinking or answering. This doesn't happen with medication. You know, it just takes something yeah. to yeah. balance your uh, chemistry in the brain and feel good and go back to function. So let me can, let me say that back to you because that sounds really important to me. That one of the things that really is maybe special, unique, or at least very impactful about this way of working is that it gives the individual like a body memory an actual experience that they can take with them and especially in the this kind of the afterglow where you might be doing some of the integration you can kind of maybe sort of solidify that in a way that they really become consciously aware of it so when they go back into their everyday life and things become difficult again, they can remember that they actually had this experience of openness or oneness or love or self-compassion or whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. That having had that experience, it gives them some resource to carry with them into their life afterwards. Absolutely. I was going to add and also suffering. Sometimes I'm afraid I'm hmm. being too... Uh, enthusiastic or passing a romanticized but this is like you dive into a cosmic soup of your yeah. living it has everything it has everything mm -hmm. but you go with with something that's um, that can help you to find healing to find new meanings yeah uh, and, and takes you out of your own narrative or temporary line and you just discover stuff that you did you learn in your family and in your school and it, it's inside there's there's this uh you can have the potentiality to understand that there's a inner gps or this mm -hmm. just the, the majesty of a majestic knowledge of our bodies and how he holds and remembers stuff that you, you mm -hmm. know, somehow in your worldview if you want um you you were not aware <clears throat> and so yeah you get to access something that's much more expansive than just socialization. Yeah. Or even like what you were getting uh, up from therapy also. Um, it can in fact just open it because it's, it's this when you do a scan and even when you're in a psychedelic state and do a scan to your brain, mm -hmm. you know, they, they have compared the normal brain and the brain uh, on, on psychedelics and it's it's like you have in the normal brain you have this slightly connections between the uh, visual and the motor area and then the emotional part and the memory and like uh, like uh, the old phones with the line and when you see the brain on psychedelics it's like optical fiber like everything that's not in connection is like like a, a city of, 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 of information all that normally doesn't connect when you're in a normal state then comes up into your awareness uh, temporarily mm -hmm. so <clears throat> it turns on all the lights at once yeah yeah like uh you know you want to see it, uh, depending on your own reference all your chakras are open up uh, mm -hmm. the flower of your awareness is totally open mm -hmm. uh, you know the, the cognitive the emotional the embodied the behavioral the environment all all of that you're just mm -hmm. you, you don't have a strong structure to filter things but it's very permeable so can i ask just because you're you're using different terms there 
And um, I want to get to something that I'm not exactly sure how to get to, but one way maybe is to ask this question. Um, having had these experiences and having worked with other people going through these experiences, has it had any impact on your own thinking kind of of what life is, what a human person is, what the body is, what therapeutic process is, anything like that? Has it had an impact on you in that way? That's a beautiful question. So personal and also intimate, you know, and, and but it's the core, it's the core. Yeah. I, I think there's this sense of owning certain feelings and perceptions that I had as a kid and I never found a place where they would be seen, where they would be held. Um, and the, the ownership of your feelings, uh, of what is behind culture, what is behind your own personality, what is behind family, what is behind uh, transgenerational trauma that we all carry, um, they, they kind of opened me to an experience where I could sense, um, I don't know, almost like my, the full potential of my being could come in and inside my body and tuned, uh, you know, just, it was like, okay, if you water a plant with, Right, the sun, the water, you put it in the right place. How can it grow? It's impossible for us to not live in history and not have the legacies of our ancestors. It's always there. But it's it's opening up to the full potentiality and deeply questioning the things that we were taught. Mm -hmm. um, but in a good way, questioning to open them. And I would say <laughs> what 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 now it's really settled here is besides um having a body being a human being part of earth being in my existence uh, in a limited time i'm also uh, uh um, we are also because i'm not talking about me i think how i see people i see myself of course how i see um the world we are part of a larger, much larger thing. We are part of cosmos. We have a cosmic nature, and we are afraid of speaking. We, we have, but the, the Earth is around the sun because there's solar system. There's systems around that <laughs> allow life to be present in such a huge space here, allow us to have uh, what is a miracle, and, and you don't think about it, you, you really feel it. It's a miracle if you take in consideration the time and, and space of the whole universe and the probability of we having a, a conscious experience, a conscious embodied experience right here with you, with others. And so it's, it's, it's much more rare than gaining the lottery in terms of probabilistically. So there's something that has been given much more ownership uh, and inside uh, of me, I would say that would be the major course, the humbleness and um, how much you have gathered as a person and knowledge and what you have built up in your own reference as a person. But then there's something else, either your body, either the environment, either nature, either earth, either whatever. There's a spiritual thing, there's a beyond thing that's also supporting your life and you're in connection with that. And so let me say that back to you so that you can correct me. Um, that what you have found is this ownership of yourself and that this self is not separate actually but as part of a whole cosmic system that includes you is that much correct yeah holds everything includes everything it's it's around yeah yeah it's around everyone um, it's, it's in my view yeah exactly and i'm curious if it 
then having discovered that or had a tangible experiences of that and uh, understood it in the way that you have so far at least has it had an impact on how you understand focusing it's 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 like focusing knows that <laughs> yeah. the felt sense knows that the felt sense is like oh okay yes of course yeah, yeah. Um, I would be more shy in terms of uh, mm, speaking out for biospirituality or the way the environment or the way you can be sensible to environment and how environment can touch you, communicate with you. Or if you're in a specific state of presence with your felt sense mm -hmm. uh, and you're interacting with a plant, mm -hmm. you might feel really what Kenton was talking about. There's There's a being there. There's something that's if you put yourself in the receptive state and present there instead of searching for or trying to bring meaning to something in that interaction, what can come from there? Uh, that's can be much more wide uh, too. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I want to just say, I love the way you say that, that the felt sense knows that. It's like the felt sense already knows that it's, not separate from the whole system the whole thing yeah yeah i would say even um I, of course it might depend of how you you feel things and interact in your own structure but um, many of my focusing experiences been you know in in the realm what what what, what is a psychedelic experience too absolutely mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. focusing but it is mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. I, I remember having an experience of focusing, where suddenly I was connected to the felt sense, the clearing the space issue, and you stop trying to find things. And it's just like fully present, and, and you see how your cells are interacting with with the environment and the bird, and mm -hmm. and suddenly I kind of felt like um, by doing that, I felt like I was a little poor on the skin of the earth. And I was opening something to breathe and to exchange mm -hmm. while it was cars passing by and mm -hmm. noise. And like, oh. so I felt that in my body and I kind of felt like the environment around me was thinking me. I don't really care if this is really happening in the sense or it can be proved, but this is the experience that uh, it can be got. And this just changes your, 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 your chemistry and your notion of connection and, and with yourself and with, with what's what's around and so that the yeah. the universe breathes itself through you yeah good <laughs> and it can even sound maniac or something like that or messianic but no it's it, the experience is like is like that is that kind of thing uh or um um, I remember, for example, having my South Sivan experience um, in a clinical context, and one of the things that came up was like this, you know, sometimes people have the experience of your father or mother putting you in your lap and letting you drive the car while you put your hands in the car and you go and, and I think, oh, I'm in the car. But it's, it's controlling everything under, underneath it. I had the same kind of experience. I did connect to that experience has a lived one during the South Sivan experience. But the way it was lived was like, so now you're going to sit down in, this, in the lap of this sort of a like it was Shiva or like a, some sort of a, what can you call it, a god or an entity or something, whatever. And you'll sit down and you're, you're writing the creativity of the forces of the whole life and universe by itself in micro and macro levels. So this is what I can put into words, Greg. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember something coming up, uh, which was like, I'm riding the cosmic horses of eternal blissful creation. This I could not pick up in a normal state. So yeah. it was like, yeah, so it, it really opens you to wonder and to awe, awe again. Maybe in a way you're... They call the default mode network. There's really, as your own personality, really inside your brain, you have like this structured links mm -hmm. because of memory, because of habits, because of 
language and there's even like a core center inside um, from which you look into the world and with psychedelics that gets shattered like a snowball mm -hmm. so it might be something like as an, an adult in a way you, you, you're living again in the brain of a child um, somehow kind of an immediacy in connection to things and feeling them that could be one of the ways of explaining how um, what this can can do sometimes um, and I'd like to just I mean I resonate with a lot of what you've said and you're right it it leads to spectacular language <laughs> um, but it's difficult to put into language because it's actual experience um, I'm just curious this is a this is a much more mundane question but I'm wondering if um, the opening up if I could call it that that you've experienced by doing this work and by focusing if it has an impact, and I don't mean an impact in that you uh, um, might guide clients to notice their bodies more, but I'm, I'm wondering about the clinical impact when you're working with other people. If almost the cosmic context that you're more tangibly aware of if that ever comes into sessions with other people or if it has any impact on your way of working with other people even if they're talking about like not getting along with their boss at work or something um a lot of that stuff can actually just be the background and very far away from there for sure um but i think if if, if the person comes up with something it's weird that's on that context. Um, the acknowledgement and, and the way I respond explicitly or implicitly, I think, allows it more um, mm -hmm. to be there. But just, we, we, like, like in focusing or existential therapy, we don't impose nothing of these things, but um, um, I think... I think not having these these sort of experiences there, I might miss a lot of things uh, from the client's experience. I think that's what... So let me say that back to you. Um, that if a client comes with something that might be a little bit unusual, they can sense from you that you're open to it. It doesn't scare you. You're not going to try to clamp down on it or something. You you actually would welcome any of these slightly unusual experiences that clients might have. And you would notice them, even if they're not making much of it. But the other thing, I'm wondering if you don't also um, sit with, this might be an odd way to say it, but sit with a slightly different body having experience what you've experienced so that even if the person is talking about a fight with their boss you have a maybe a slightly different um perspective in the way that you hear that uh, that you maybe hear it and receive it in a more spacious way and that that might make some kind of a difference to the client, even if your response is just to stay with their content, the way they're presenting it, that somehow your bodily processing of it is is a little bit more uh, expansive or something. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's hey, yeah, definitely. Like when you brought that back what where I went to was 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 kind of a, even the mundane things uh I, I think they they are seen and felt and received with as much um reverence yeah. as <clears throat> classical ones absolutely it's yeah. it's it's yeah the both are 
are there, it's really weird how to navigate yeah. the, the, the expansion and the spectrum of it. But um, um, I was like, from mundane to, to little things, like it's, <clears throat> or, I think the level of presence and the level of attention, Greg, uh, that what what you're able to notice when we you were with someone, it is expanded. Yeah, uh, it is expanded, and and also in this mundane fight with the boss, uh, if you were with, with that body, with that presence, uh, other. Um, um, connections and avenues can really can help them out to <laughs> unfold definitely and that word reverence is the same word that was kind of in my mind when you said it i'm just conscious of time i feel like it might be a little bit frustrating to other people because we touched on so many things that require an hour at least of <laughs> further discussion um yeah. but this is a nice introduction. I really enjoyed it. But I want, before we finish, I just want to ask you if there's anything left for you that you would like to say, anything that we didn't quite finish, or any other aspect of your work that you're particularly passionate about and would like to mention? Um, sorry, I'm coughing. Um, I, I maybe regarding still this 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 place of the psychedelic assisted therapy, um, I I think it it might be good just just to mention if people want to start somewhere about uh, looking at a, a book or some reference. There's this book from Michael Pollan called How to Change Your Mind. Um, there's a lot of books. But this is more mainstream, is a reporter connected to uh, food, uh, nutrition, coffee, is a scientific reporter in a way. And he opened up a project to, by himself, explore these substances. So he, he, he then reports what it was, who he was as a person, and what this, these substances brought, and then all the scientific and psychedelic renaissance. So it's a good book, How to Change Your Mind. You can find it anywhere. It even got into a Netflix series. Yeah. That's one good. There, there are others, but that can open a lot of doors as a, as a, as a reference. Um, also, we have a, a very interesting paper on focusing in psychedelics, which was written by... Uh, Alicia Danford, uh, she's connected to MAPS and the MDMA therapy. She even has done studies with autism and MDMA or social anxiety and MDMA. But she wrote a piece, uh, it's a small piece in the Journal of Transpersonal Psychology called something like uh, uh, Focusing as a Supplement for Preparation of Psychedelic Assisted Therapy. <clears throat> so for our folks also, might be interesting to to go there, yeah. Um, and she kind of presents something in a way, and then gives an idea, an interesting idea, uh, like a felt sense idea. Now we can go into details afterwards. Maybe it's worth it uh, of how they they mingle together. Uh, and, and, um, yeah. Interpersonal, interpersonal, and and uh, transpersonal too. So she's, she she kind of which these three, we could even add the, the social and political and economical, because one of the issues that's uh, it's it's money and then an investment and science also is based on investment. So investors would want to search one thing or the whole spectrum, not everything. Things that are sustainable, like focusing, for example, you cannot patent them, so they're not that interesting for the market. So. Mm. Um, but focusing has this sustainability, mostly with partnerships too. And with psychedelic assisted therapy, you know, it's very expensive. Two therapists, for example, all of the personal resources, hospital resources, and the money it costs, and trying to 
put this in the system in a way that can be acceptable to anyone mm -hmm. that needs it. Uh, but then integration afterwards and therapy afterwards also has costs. So if something like focusing can come here, it's a regulation, uh, self-regulation uh, thing or contemplative thing, um, and you can do it with another person, so it's sustainable. Yeah. And besides being sustainable, Greg, it connects you to another person still. It's interpersonal. So the society and the communities, the possibility is still there. Yeah. So like, this is another thing that the grand craft by looking. It's all there. It's all there. But, um, so I'm very excited about this. I'm talking to people and anyone that's interested. Um, I don't know how to create a structure and plan strategically. That's sometimes one of my failures, but the, the, the openness and the welcoming is there to gather people that might be, feel interest and you know to maybe create something uh, substantial connected to this and uh, help this. Um, and I'm just saying that my whole professional life and work, weirdly, the things that I have been doing, and sometimes I well, we're a bit lost where I was going. All of that is making sense in the psychedelic um, uh, um, territory. Mm -hmm. It has a way to um, to hold everything somehow. It shines a light on your path so that you can see it more clearly. Yeah. And definitely, again, it's not the substance, but what it opens to, and it opens to our felt sense. Yeah, exactly. Opens to a knowledge and implicit knowledge that we have here that has been here for thousands of years. It has found its way to survive in this planet, and it has a wisdom. And us, we, that is something that's part of my vision and my passion is it, it just all needs to be uh, looked upon and, and, and taught. And, um, so everything that Kind of just to there is is kind of my my passion. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. I and I will um, I'll put some kind of a link so that people can find you, and uh, perhaps join with you in this sort of exciting adventure. And uh, if possible, if we could find the Danford paper, maybe I could put a link to that as well. Yeah, absolutely. I'll give them all those links back to you. Okay can do that yeah terrific thank you very much it's been absolutely fascinating and uh makes me want to know more thank you so much for the invitation greg it was great to be here with you and sorry that we cannot fit everything in <laughs> one hour but well we might have to yeah. have a part two <laughs> yeah more more integration yeah <laughs> more integration yeah. <laughs> thanks very much Joe. Bye, bye, yeah. Greg. Yeah, thank bye. you